Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark, and I'm joined by our regulars, Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center, Damon Linker of The Week, and Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal. Our special guest this week is Samuel Hammond, Director of Poverty and Welfare Policy at the Niskanen Center. So thank you one and all for being here. Um, Sam, we were very eager to hear from you because I gather you had a big role in helping Senator Romney develop his um, child allowance plan. And um, so I'd love to hear from you about the differences between what Romney proposed and what was enacted uh, in this COVID relief bill, um, the, the the Biden plan. Um, obviously, the, Bi- the biggest thing is that the Biden one is just for one year. It would now need to be renegotiated uh, to be re-upped. But, uh, but tell us what you think are the outstanding differences. Yeah. So, um, you know, my work goes back and on this area for five years now, we wrote a paper in 2016 called Towards a Universal Child Benefit. Um, and one of the goals all this entire time has been to reform the way we support children and families to make a more inclusive benefit system. Um, anticipating that the, the Biden credit is going to be up for renewal probably as soon as December because um, the tax year and the calendar year don't overlap exactly. Uh-huh. Um, the, the, the Republicans are going to need a plan B. Republicans have historically been the champions of the child tax credit dates back to Ralph Reed and the contract with America and, you know, most recently expanded under president Trump. What Biden has done um, is similar in spirit to what Romney has proposed. He's made the child credit fully refundable, which means it's flat regardless of your earnings. You could have, you could have no income and still, still receive a a monthly benefit. Um, What Romney wants to do is, is similar, but he wants to do it through the Social Social Security Administration rather than the IRS, because the IRS was never set up to be a, you know, benefit uh, administer. It's a revenue collection agency. uh, And so it's going to run into some serious problems at the gate. um, Can I I interrupt you real quick just to uh, spell out? Um, So under the current um, uh, child tax credit, uh, people have to apply for their, they, they have to file their taxes or they have to, you know, have Correct. a tax preparer help them to, you know, fill out all the proper forms to get this benefit. Whereas under the Romney plan and I gather under the Biden plan, uh, the government will simply mail people checks every month, depending on how many children they have. Um, but you're saying the Social Security Administration is a lot better at sending checks to people. The IRS has never done it. That's right. Well, they've done done it in very ad hoc occasions, like these uh, stimulus checks, but never something that's been recurring. Okay. Um, and the the big issue is not just that. Well, you do you do still have to apply for the Biden credit. They're basing it off of your uh, previous year's tax returns. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, if this is made permanent, you'll have to apply year over year by filing your taxes. And one of the big issues, actually, an issue that wait, Ronnie wait, raised. Wait, well, I'm I'm confused. I thought that everybody gets a flat amount per child. So why does it matter what your taxes were the previous year? Uh, well, the democratic plan phases out. So that's, that's the first okay. thing. So they need to check your income. And the second okay. thing is, you know, this is a benefit that is supposed to follow the child. So, um, you know, by nature, tax returns are annual. Mm-hmm. And so if you have a change in marital status, change in custody, a birth or a death, any of those things mid year, they're going to have to make adjustments. Um, okay. and, and so, Right now, it's on an annual basis. But if it was done in the Social Security Administration, if you if you have have a divorce or get married or have a new kid, those benefits would be able to be updated instantaneously um, instead of having to wait an entire year to refile your taxes. Okay. Um, so, what about the Biden plan worries you, if anything? I think the biggest thing is this, just that it's purely additive, um, right? So one of the ulterior motives of the Romney plan is it also makes these reforms to the earned income tax credit, which is a important uh, work subsidy, but it's a work subsidy that has a large marriage penalty. And one of the reasons why that marriage penalty has never been removed is it's just expensive. Um, so as long as you're increasing benefits very dramatically, it's, it's the, it's literally the opportunity to reform some of these other more broken systems um, because you, you, you can be confident that everyone will be better off uh, 
in, in net. Um, so by taking a purely additive approach, um, I think they're, you know, first of all, Democrats are kind of squandering an opportunity to, to do some cleanup. But also, you know, right now the U.S. is spending like a, a modern social democracy, but taxing like it's a medieval entrepot. So, with it, the, you know, something about this equilibrium is not going to hold. And, you know, we can't just deficit finance our way into Denmark. We, <laughs> we have to uh, find ways of paying for programs, especially if they're being made permanent. Um, and that's a that's a bridge that the Democrats haven't been haven't crossed yet, right? And so, yeah, far you know, from just it. The, just this week, there's there's sort of things being leaked to the press about Biden looking to raise taxes on people making over four hundred thousand dollars. So they're they're starting to look around for money that they can raise, but um, in the longer run, it's going to be really important to the, the durability, the political durability of this program to have bipartisan buy-in. They don't want to do you know, Obamacare all over again, where it's passed through some party lines and becomes um, becomes something for the right to campaign against. What about the argument that this will um, repeat the errors of the 60s and 70s, where we had we passed generous welfare plans, uh, aid to families with dependent children was was boosted, and people felt, especially Republicans, felt that there were disincentives to work, and that after the welfare reform. Uh, of the uh, Clinton years, you saw um, a, a, a much diminished um, uh, child poverty rate that the mothers who had been receiving AFDC then went went to work in large numbers. So how do you respond to all of that? Um, I, I kind of break, this is maybe too simplistic, but I, I kind of break um, two different paradigms uh, according to sort of FDR New Deal style paradigm and the and the Lyndon Johnson Great Society style paradigm. And I and I place Romney's proposal more in that FDR camp. It is a kind of social security for kids, a broad-based universal social insurance program that in the same way that that uh, social security is a retirement program that happens to pull uh, you know 40 million senior citizens out of poverty. Um, a child allowance is a family program that happens to uh, cut child poverty dramatically as well. Um, and that, and I think that's important, an important distinction because one of the, I think, original sins of the great society era was by, was the kind of targeting of, of poverty per se. And that ends up leading you down, um, very bespoke ad hoc programs that are intensely targeted and on the flip side, uh, have very high marginal tax rates if you want to, want to exit. And, and one of the, you know, the things that this is trying to clean up is actually the, the way in which the status quo is a very bifurcated system where if you're middle class, you get a simple tax credit, but if you're low income or, or very poor, because maybe you never worked in the first place and you're, you're a 21 year old single mom just out of school, um, you you end up being funneled into these welfare bureaucracies, bureaucracies that are very hard to get out of once you're in them. Right. And it's not just the cash assistance. It's also the entire suite of wraparound programs from housing assistance to childcare to children's health insurance. Um, and once you're, funneled into that program by dint of a, a cash, a cash flow prop, a pro, uh, problem, right? You don't have the money. You're not poor. You're just broke. You can end up right. becoming poor in the, in the richer sense of the term, because you become acculturated into, into the, a, a set of very sticky social institutions. Yeah. Um, Damon, let me bring you in here. Uh, the idea of simplifying all of these anti-poverty programs is, has tremendous appeal as far as I'm concerned. You know, we have Medicaid, we have Section 8 housing vouchers, SNAP, WIC, Head Start, Early Head Start, TANF, low-income home energy assistance. And each one of those requires, first of all, it requires the poor to jump through a million hoops. Um, and therefore, you know, the participation rate is not what it could be. Um, but it also, you know, makes you know, it leads to duplication. It leads to inefficiencies. Um, so doesn't it make more sense to just give people checks and go, go ahead and answer that? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Great answer. When you first started the question, yeah. I, I was like formulating in my head what I would say, and then you just sort of did it for me. So thank you. Um, <laughs> No, I, I I agree with everything you said, and I've written a column or two about this uh, over the last six weeks or so, that one huge advantage to a lot of the discussions around policy since Biden came in, and I very much include 
Romney's uh, proposal uh, that we've been talking about, which I, I think is fantastic, um, fall into this camp of of let's just make this simple. Let's just give people money. <laughs> just send them a check. Let them use it to better their lives. And that's all that's required. It doesn't there. And there are many ways in which it can be complicated. One of which is what you both have been talking about, which is you enter this kind of bureaucratic maze where you're, you're having to uh, justify needing money in all of these different ways from different piles. And you need to constantly be demonstrating need, which creates often perverse incentives. Um, and, and so it's, re and it's also very inefficient in the sense that we're spending far more money to pay the bureaucrats to run the program than we would need to, if we just cut a check and sent it to people so that you get more bang for your buck. But then there's also that when it comes to the question of buy-in by the American people, I just think that it, it, you know, maybe it's really just this simple in another sense that a lot of hostility to government among the American people has to do with this precisely this kind of bureaucratic quality of it and the attempt that we always feel like we're sort of engaging in major social engineering projects to kind of nudge people this way and that way and prevent this behavior and that behavior. Whereas this instead is, in a, is an example of just kind of cutting out the, the really ambitious stuff, which as I think Sam rightly pointed out was, was one of the real downsides of the great society ambitions in the mid sixties. And to just say, Look, we as a society think kids are important and it's important that we support raising them and getting them out of poverty and getting them on their way to a successful life. And that's worth an investment. And so we send the money to do it and that's it. There's nothing more complicated about it. And I suspect that that's um, a use of government that more Americans would be comfortable endorsing and benefiting from. So I'm I'm all for uh, I'm all for this. I'm, I'm I'm very much a booster. So Bill Galston, the problem is that um, Romney's not president, and um, and therefore the the plan that's going forward is one that really just doubles down on all of these programs and gives them more money. I mean that's what's in the Biden plan, in addition to the new money. But th there's no pairing away of all of these other layers. In fact. They're cushioned. Um, do you think there's any chance that we could, you know, with with Democrats being in, in charge, that we could get some kind of simplicity out of our overly cludged up um, poverty bureaucracy? I do. Uh, and I say that because I think the, the experience of the past two months has had the effect of energizing uh, senators in both political parties who are determined to have a greater influence on the policy process in the next year and a half than they have so far. This is, this is the so-called G20, uh, the group of 20 in, that has been meeting uh, pretty regularly and met again last night. Uh, Romney is part of the group, and I'm sure he'll be an active proponent of uh, you know of some changes in the program that was just uh, that was just enacted, uh, and so I don't think I don't think the past is prologue here, at least not necessarily. Uh, let me just as a as a veteran of the welfare reform wars during the Clinton administration, <laughs> I'm you know I'm having you know a flashback syndrome. But let me just let me just put my general perspective on the table for what it's worth. Uh, as I see it, we want to do five things with, with bills like this. There are five objectives that we're thinking about. Uh, you know, number one, obviously, we want to reduce child poverty to an absolute minimum. Uh, second, we want to encourage, not discourage, labor force participation. Uh, third, we want to make sure that children aren't held hostage to the bad choices made by their parents. Uh, 
you know, fourth, we want what we do to be fiscally sustainable. And fifth, as Sam pointed out, we want it to be politically sustainable as well. It has turned out to be very difficult to do all five of those things at the same time. Uh, and the art of policymaking is to get as close as possible. Uh, but you're always going to fall short, I suspect, on one dimension or or another. I do think that of the things to be avoided the most, child poverty is at the top of the list. And if I have to make some sacrifices along other dimensions to make sure that we hold uh, poverty among children in America to an absolute minimum, I'd be willing to do that. Okay. Um, Linda, I was listening to a uh, panel discussion from the American Enterprise Institute on this topic. And um, Robert Doerr, uh, who had experience uh, in the, um, in the uh, uh, Bloomberg administration in New York, and was very involved in anti-poverty efforts, um, is very worried about getting rid of the bureaucracy. He actually thinks that the bureaucracy is important because he's worried that, you know, if you just send checks to say single mothers um, who have very low skills, not much education and so forth, that um, they will not be given the beneficial interactions of a social worker who might be able to get them into the world of work. And once you're in the world of work, you, um, you get access to all kinds of other good things in this world, he, he argues. And, um, and you get, uh, and if you have interaction with a social worker, you get uh, routed to drug abuse prevention or, or treatment and various other things. So he's concerned that, that this idea of sending people checks, what do you, what's your view? Well, I think that's a legitimate concern. Um, I do believe that, you know, this idea that people will always make the right choices is demonstrably wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the idea that we're just going to send checks out and we're going to assume that uh, mothers get those checks and decide to buy more nutritious meals um, is probably, you know, not borne out by what will happen. Um, and so I think that's a legitimate concern. But I think there's a bigger question here and one that we're avoiding. This is a mass redistribution of wealth. And we've, you know, been uh, comfortable in the past with redistributing wealth from uh, workers to non-workers, from working age people to the elderly, uh, I agree uh, absolutely with Bill that child poverty uh, should be our number one concern, but how we go about alleviating that and what the best way to do that, I think, is what needs to be debated. And, you know, at the end of the day, these programs do have to be paid for. I guess I would be more comfortable with a child credit that was more narrowly aimed at uh, the poor, uh, and particularly those who are extremely poor, uh, and done in a way that uh, does, you know, not totally eliminate um, the possibility that you're going to have some intervention through housing, through supervision, um, through checking on the welfare of the children uh, who are in these homes. But, you know, we have not had that debate. I mean, this it is as if we are moving to the grand, you know, scheme of, of social democracy and um, in Scandinavia and elsewhere without there ever having been a debate about it and consensus about it. And that always worries me. And doing it uh, in the face of a crisis is one thing. But if we're going to have this kind of major overhaul uh, of our system where the childless are subsidizing those with children, uh, those families with children, where working people, uh, particularly those who are, you know, upper middle class and middle class are subsidizing uh, those um, who are not. Um, these are things that require thought and, and that you don't just rush into uh, because a pandemic hit. So that's my concern. <clears throat> so Sam, um, one of the things that I think Republicans had right um, back in the day, I don't know that they're arguing this 
much anymore. But um, one of the chief um, one of the chief engines of poverty in America and inequality, rising inequality, is family disintegration. Um, that a, 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 a huge percentage of the children, something like 46% of the children of single mothers are living in poverty. And it's like 8% of children in married couple homes, to give you an example. And uh, among minorities, the, the numbers are even more stark. Um, and um, so I am a little bit stymied. I mean, I do wish that there were something to encourage um to encourage marriage now i your plan did did in some ways eliminate the marriage penalty in the law i mean we can't obviously there's a limit to how much you can do through government action to encourage marriage it's very much of a cultural and social thing but um can you talk though for a minute about the um the marriage penalties that are in the current code and the current system yeah absolutely um you know, so first, uh, first of all, it, you have to identify wh- where the problem is in, in, fam- in family formation, and it's not in the upper classes. Upper class families are divorcing less, staying married. They're having two and a half kids. <laughs> They're doing the the entire yeah. success, success sequence. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really been concentrated within working class communities, and these are actually the, often the communities that are directly receiving the earned income tax credit. The one of the larger marriage penalties that I mentioned, and that and that pen, uh, and that credit, if you're in the plateau, meaning you're receiving the maximum benefit, your the income um, penalty from getting married can be as much as twenty five percent of your income. Mm. Now, now I'm I'm totally you know willing to believe that people don't make big life decisions like marriage on the basis of a few hundred bucks, but um, there's a lot of evidence that people EITC recipients optimize the amount of hours they're getting. And, and and hours are working to receive the maximum benefit. So they're very sensitive to these small income changes. And when it's when you're talking about twenty five percent of your income, that is a, that's a massive hit to getting married. So what what we see is instead a, a growth in cohabitation, right? Um, mm-hmm. And on top of this, you know, many of the forces that are driving uh, family disintegration are not amenable to to or don't trace their roots to the tax code per se. They're things like the loss of Middle skill jobs in former manufacturing towns. Dave, you know, David Otter's work, um, I think, has shown pretty convincingly that when you know, quote unquote, good jobs disappear, the marriageability of men <laughs> declines pretty rapidly, uh, and you yeah. end up. Get, uh, I, uh, I have my doubts about that data, but we could talk about that some other time. But anyway, <laughs> well, I, I do think it's important um, culturally, or, or an important dynamic explaining why someone like Romney is is coming forward in this moment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, going back to those '90s debates, there was this narrative uh, about the culture of poverty and treating this as a purely cultural phenomenon. But what we're seeing in many white working class communities are very parallel phenomena. Um, And they're not occurring because of a big cultural shift, but because of of a pretty sudden uh, economic transformation. And when, you you know, it's opiates, not crack. And um, it's, you know, rural towns, not not the urban inner cities. But um, those parallels are striking. And I think they're causing people to rethink um, some of their prior assumptions about what caused the, the earlier problem. Well, actually, I would beg to differ. Um, I, I went into this kind of at length in my um, last book, Sex Matters. Um, and uh, I actually believe that the um, change was cultural in both instances, both among you know Black neighborhoods and, and, and Black uh, families and uh, and white. It's just that the black families got there first, um, but it was the same sort of thing—a change in attitudes about whether, for example, it was you'd be embarrassed if your child got pregnant without you know being married and you know unwed pregnancy. All those things you can see a strong change in um, in values really um, among among uh, people. And it's as I say, it started first with blacks, but then spread spread to white. So anyway, that's my view. But, um, but okay, this was a good discussion. And um, there's a lot here. And uh, so you think that this may this whole topic will come up again for debate because as early as December, then? Yeah, I mean, this is this is no ordinary fiscal cliff. It's a fiscal cliff that um, would throw, you know, 10 million children back into poverty. Uh, So there's going to be a lot of, of 
focus debate on it. And, okay. um, and, you know, especially if they want to pay for it and make it permanent, they're going to need more than just, uh, you know, Kamala Harris to break the tie. Right, right, right. Well, I'm, I'm relying on Bill Galston to get his G20 group to, uh, come up with a great compromise. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, the um, the situation at the border um, has gotten a tremendous amount of attention in the past week, and even though we did discuss it briefly last week, I want to I want to return to it uh, because um, because we're hearing from a number of uh, Democrats either that you know that you're hearing from progressive Democrats that they they want uh, you know a huge uh, comprehensive immigration reform. Um, At the same time, you are hearing from Republicans that this is going to be their gambit to win back the House in 2022. Um, So, Linda, let me let me start with you. What do you make of the argument? I mean, I think that the House is voting today on the Dream and Promise Act and the Farm Modernization Workforce Act. Um, So that would allow dreamers to, um, to be, uh, to be given permanent residency. And I guess some farmers, some farm workers, um, do you think this is a profound, this, this kind of thing is a profound threat to Biden's popularity and, and success as a president? Well, first of all, I think the two bills that are up before the House, which uh, are going to be voted on uh, later today on Thursday, um, and are likely to pass, and they may pass with at least a handful uh, of Republican supporters, are are exactly the right thing to be doing. We're not talking about letting in new people. We're talking about people who are already here, in in the one case, the DACA recipients. And by the way, the DACA recipients uh, have a sort of Damocles hanging over their head right now. There is a court case uh, that was remanded back um, in Texas, and uh, it was a case Uh, brought by various attorneys general, uh, and the judge in that case um, earlier had struck down uh, provisions of the uh, uh, then Obama rules on people who were here getting deferred uh, action uh, uh, for deportation, and it struck down those who were family members um, of DACA. Um, and so, you know, these kids could, in fact, lose their protection. So I think getting this passed is important. I think that it is likely um, that the Senate will take up something um, uh, to protect the DACA workers and the farm workers. We're talking about the people who pick our crops. You know, 70, 80 percent of these people are in the country illegally, but we absolutely depend on them. So uh, the farm worker uh, Workforce Modernization Act, which will be voted on today, essentially gives legal status to people who have been here uh, and worked in agriculture at least 180 days over the last two years. So we're not talking about something that's going to be a pull. On the other hand, um, you know, what's happening at the border right now? We talked about it last week. Um, it doesn't seem to be getting better. Uh, There are uh, a lot of new uh, people coming in, and these are mostly children that we have to to worry about, uh, who are coming in, who are straining uh, the areas that are supposed to take care of them. The, The Border Patrol is only supposed to keep them in detention for 72 hours, and then they're supposed to be turned over to the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Uh, and those resources are being strained. Um, however, there's some um, there's some evidence, and the Cato Institute put out a very good paper on this uh, this week, that many of these children are children who have been separated voluntarily by their parents because their parents trying to come in um, are still being turned away at the border uh, under the provision uh, having to do with our health laws that says that we're not bringing in people uh, claiming asylum at the, at the because moment. of COVID because of COVID right these were the Trump era uh, rules and so apparently somewhere uh, around 70 percent of the kids who are now coming in unaccompanied have relatives who brought them here they were in family units they tried to come through as families got turned away and therefore the children are now coming uh, on their own so yeah it's a problem it's something we have to deal with um 
It's something we've faced many times before, including under President Trump in 2019. The numbers were very, very high. In 2014, they were um, as high as they are now or higher. Um, And I know the Republicans would like to take this as an issue that they hope is going to give them an issue at the ballot box, but it's not clear Um, that it's going to have quite the same salience as it has in the past, because you're not seeing um, the number of people coming in. uh, They're actually not getting in. Uh, We're not seeing a flood of people getting through the border. The only people that we're seeing at the border who are getting in are children and a very small number of families that are claiming asylum. So it's not clear that it's going to work to the Republicans' benefit. Uh, Damon, uh, uh, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas said that Biden was purposely bringing in, uh, immigrants with, with COVID. Um, (laughs) uh, so there's that. Um, and, uh, Senator Bill Cassidy alleged that, uh, that one of Biden's officials had said in Spanish, the border is open. And then in English, the border is not open. In fact, what she did was she misspoke in Spanish and quickly corrected it, but Cassidy ran with it. Um, so they clearly think this is their this is their best uh, their best gambit. Um, on the other hand, you know the um, some Democrats say, well, look, you know, of course the Republicans are going to try to gin up the hysteria about immigrants, but. It didn't do them much good in 2018 when there was a lot of hysteria about uh, caravans heading for the border. Um, So what's your sense of the political salience of this issue? Well, I mean, as with so many issues these days, uh, and I think this, the immigration issue is even more so than many other issues. This really just uh, comes down to base mobilization. I mean, Is the Republican base uh, able to be motivated by this issue? Absolutely. And really the, the, the issue of like whether it's true or not, or someone misspoke or not, or whether kids are getting in with or without adults, and if the kids are getting in because the law says they have to be admitted, Um, And so, you know, unless Biden goes along with Trump's rules to exclude them because of COVID, then uh, then uh, we have to let them in. These nuances are irrelevant anyway, because the the right will say whatever it needs to to uh, gin up uh, a lot of anxiety and fear and anger about this. And it will work with some of its voters. And given how close both the House and the Senate are, uh, it, it could end up being decisive or it might not. I mean, we just we don't know exactly uh, how it will eventually play out. But, you know, I get from a purely cynical political standpoint why they're why they're doing this. But I don't as typical. What I mean by typical is that it, it's it's as usual, not the Republicans trying to make an argument that actually has any hope of winning majority public opinion or persuading any persuadables in the middle. It's all about whipping their own voters into the most intense froth of indignation possible so that they will all, every single one of them show up to vote in every district. And maybe that'll be enough to just inch them over the line and they can get a majority. So, um, you know, the, the, the problem with immigration in political terms is it is one where there, there are some people who are totally against any additional immigration at all. And then there are some people on the left who are in a, are, are in favor of, if not by name, open borders, a kind of de facto open border policy of the kind that some of the Democratic candidates during the primaries last year uh, favored. And then in the middle, you have a kind of semi-informed sense that, well, we shouldn't be mean and, you know, we do need these people and the people who've been here a while should be allowed to stay, but we shouldn't have too many. And you put all that together in our polarized system and it's paralysis. And that's where we've been for over, we're well over a decade now. So I, mm-hmm. I will be very mm-hmm. eager to see if anything can get <clears throat> through Congress. I'm a bit of a a skeptic about that just because it's failed so many times at this point. But 
um, you know, the, the Republicans uh, thing is just, it's what they do now. This is what politics is to them. And it's whipping up their own voters with a mix of truth and falsehood to keep them agitated and showing up at the polls. And there's not much more to it than that, I think. Yeah. Um, in light of Damon's comments, uh, Bill, let me just read you part of a um, Tom Cotton quote. He said that their uh, Democrats' immigration policy is toxic. And he said, you have strong voices in the Democratic Party that disparage borders in general and think we should be granting asylum to all of these people. Um, so what's your sense of it? Do you think the, um, do you think the, the Biden administration is threading the needle or not? Well, uh, let me talk about this for just a minute and then try to put it in a larger political context. Uh, the, the administration clearly needs to get a handle on, on this issue uh, in no small measure because it involves children. You know, and as we've seen, you know, children can be an emotional flashpoint in every debate in which they figure centrally. Uh, and, you know, the idea that that children admitted under, in the current legal architecture would be held for extensive periods in HHS facilities uh, is, that is not a great outcome. And the longer it persists, the late, less great it will become. Uh, so it is a policy problem that needs not just to be managed, but to be ameliorated. It can't be entirely solved, uh, but we can do better. And with adequate resources, I think we will. But let me try Let me try to put this issue into what I see as a larger political context. In the past week, there has been a very interesting, if quiet, discussion among Republican Party strategists, you know, who have converged on the conclusion that the Republicans completely failed to mount an effective argument against the administration's COVID-19 rescue bill. Uh, they pointed out, for example, uh, that the Republican Party had forfeited its credibility on fiscal management and you know, deficit limitation. Uh, they pointed out that the Republican Party had no effective counter arguments against either the claim that people in need would benefit uh, from the bill or that the economy would receive a boost from the bill. And therefore, these Republican strategists concluded there is an enormous temptation to change the subject away from an argument that the party in current circumstances can't figure out how to win. Well, but ceding the economic argument to the other party is always a dangerous business. Uh, why is it that uh, Republicans in Congress spent the better part of a week you know, focusing on the effort to cancel six Dr. Seuss books while the COVID-19 bill was moving forward. It's because they didn't think they could talk about anything else with credibility. This is a And big... because their voters wanted the checks. Well, that too, yeah. right? As I said, they couldn't mount any effective counter argument against the proposition that people would benefit or that the economy would get a boost. Uh, and of course, the people who benefit include many of their own voters. And by the way, their own voters figured that out for themselves. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, they didn't need Joe Biden to tell them that. So all, all in all, you know, the fact that we're that Republicans are now fo focusing on an, an issue that has proven in the past to be an effective mobilizer for them is a reflection of weakness, not strength, in my opinion. And I'll make one other point. Uh, Every recent survey has shown that immigration has fallen far down the list of intense public concerns. It was a core issue in, in 2016 when President Trump used it to such great effect. Whether it's that core issue right now in the minds of the American people is a different question altogether. 
uh, Sam, uh, the um, you're a policy wonk, um, and I'm sure you must feel a sense of frustration that, as a, as so many of us do, that when it comes to these sort of you know ticklish and problematic things, we we cannot for the for a lot of the time uh, we cannot come and reason together, and so I. I would like to ask you, though, in an ideal world, um, I'll, I'll give you two things that I think would be good reforms about immigration, and I'd be curious to hear yours. I, I think it would be good to change the asylum system because it was designed, as Linda was saying last week, it was designed for a different era. It was designed for a different population. It was not meant to to apply to people who are basically fleeing poverty and and uh, you know that sort of thing, which is is now the way it's being used. And so I would try to reform the asylum system in general. I don't know if that would fly. Um, but um, uh, so that that's that's one thought. I forgot I had another one, but I forgot it. So let's go with that. Let's what would you say? <laughs> Um, well, you know, I, I take a lot of lessons from my home country, Canada, uh, because we seem to do immigration very well. And, and the lessons I take from there is, is sort of reveal what is the, the wicked problem in, in the U S where we have a set of solutions that we know, um, can work, but for various reasons, some political, some policy, um, they can't go through. So, you know, one example, um, you know, we know, that the having a lot of temporary immigration uh, that's connected to an employer um, is a recipe for visa overstays and for complaints about um, labor exploitation. In the in, in the Canadian context, we ha- we, we have you know we do have some guest worker programs, but overwhelmingly immigration is um, always on a pathway to if not citizenship then permanent residency, where you have total flexibility to work for whichever employer you want. Um, and that that's one way of addressing the economic problem. But if you're if if you're using economics uh, as cover for a deeper cultural um, complaint with immigration, then those the those alternatives uh, will won't you know won't move you. Um, and w- when it comes to uh, the crisis at the bo- the crisis at the border and, and our refugee system, I also take inspiration from Canada. Uh, Canada has probably the, the most successful um, private refugee resettlement uh, program in the world that harnesses civil society, churches, local community organizations um, to not only resettle uh, refugees, but to integrate them and get them on their feet. Um, and it's incredibly successful. We could do something similar. I mean, the U.S. has plenty of churches and, and, and charitable organizations that would be up for that job. Um, and it's clear that the, uh, the formal system is utterly overwhelmed. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a system that you can just build up uh, because um, because it's being driven by these sort of surge capacity problems. You know, we're not always going to be having uh, tens of thousands of people uh, and, and 10,000 unaccompanied minors at the border. That that these are extraordinary times, um, and so we need a uh, it, we need to take the situation really seriously and treat you know you know globalism is, is not in fashion anymore. But to take maybe at least a continent wide perspective. Uh, and say, you know, what are the ways that we can um, actually address the, the demand side and the supply side issues simultaneously while projecting a sense that we have control? Because I think, you know, if there's any one big lesson I take from Canada's success, it's not the rate of immigration that people care about. It's the sense that they have, they have lost control of the system. Um, mm. You can have a million new immigrants coming every year through a, through a formal process, and people are very happy with that. It's when It's when there's... A sense of loss of control um, that I think, as Damon sort of implied, is often invited by uh, folks on the right because it is uh, a source of you know uh, it gives pours fuel on the, on the fire of, of of their backlash politics. Could, mm. could I just uh, uh, agree with Sam on one thing, but correct him on another? We do have a very successful refugee uh, program in the United States, uh, at least until the Trump era. Uh, and the refugee uh, program is not what's at issue here. Mona is correct. It is our asylum policy. These are two very different populations. Refugees come into the United States uh, until Trump uh, in rather large numbers, um, up to 100,000, 125,000 
thousand a year, uh, and they are vetted uh, through the United Nations uh, High Commission for Refugees. They come in and they are given substantial help. And as you suggested, Sam, it is done by the private sector. It's done in coordination with churches and other uh, NGOs that help resettle these uh, people, and it's very successful. That program ground to a halt during the Trump years, uh, basically because of COVID. And Biden himself has not yet uh, released the numbers uh, of refugees that we are going to admit. But the real problem is asylum seekers, and that does need to be dealt with. Thank you for that, Linda. But I actually would like to just correct you a little bit. Uh, Trump uh, actually cut way back on refugees right from the beginning. It didn't start with COVID. No, uh, you're right. He, but yeah, he ended. Yeah. He ended any refugees coming. Right. No, it dropped down to like ten, ten thousand. Yeah. But then yeah. he ended any refugees coming in last year. Yeah, which was shameful, and that should be fixed. That can be fixed immediately by Biden with a stroke of a pen. Bill, did you have one other thing you wanted to add? Yeah. Uh, and as sort of a, a big potential footnote uh, <clears throat> to Sam's invocation of the Canadian immigration system, which I've studied in great detail, and it is indeed a model that we would do well to look at, and I would say emulate, but it would be a revolution in American immigration policy. Nobody else in the world does immigration the way we do, with seven in 10 uh, green card recipients, uh, getting them on the basis of family reunification. Yep. Uh, and the Canadians had an enormous cr- controversy about immigration in, in the 70s and 80s and up until the mid 90s. And then when they skitch, uh, switched to a skills based system, uh, the public opinion was entirely transformed on the question. And it's now a very popular system among Canadians. So we should think big when we think about reforming immigration. Just you know, nips and tucks around the status quo, I think, will not make a fundamental difference. I completely agree, um, and uh, and it's a shame because uh, uh, that that was one thing that one decent thing that Trump had made noises about. Uh, supporting during the 2016 campaign. He had talked about skills-based immigration occasionally, but of course he didn't follow through. All right. Um, Let us now turn to uh, another huge subject. I don't know if we'll have time to really get into it, but, um, but the, uh, there's a lot going on in in, uh, DC these days. So one of the topics is now, should we abolish the filibuster? And uh, Bill Galston, I'm going to start with you this time. Um, the president has said that he might be, well, he, I guess he endorsed the talking filibuster. What do you make about make of that? Well, it's a back to the future proposal. Mm-hmm. You know, within living memory and certainly within Joe Biden's memory as a member of the Senate, that's what the filibuster was. Uh, and uh, it imposes costs on both the majority and the minority. Uh, mm-hmm. But... I, th- you know, uh, frankly, I think it's well worth considering. Could things get worse? And uh, <laughs> let me, you know, let me just add one other point. The filibuster doesn't just come at one point in the legislative process. It comes at two, you know, one at the end, but the other at the threshold when you have to get 60 votes if, you know, if the issue is contested simply to open debate in the Senate. Uh, I have talked to a number of senior Republican senators who are not so sure they're comfortable with that anymore. Uh, And so allowing the American people to see critical issues debated on the floor of the Senate would, I think, be a good first step. Um, Damon, Charlie Dent, a former congressman and a nice, solid, never-Trump guy like Charlie Dent, uh, but he wrote a piece saying that uh, he's against reforming the filibuster or abolishing it. Uh, He says that it encourages bipartisan compromise. What do you say to that? Well, that's, I think, exactly backwards. Um, (laughs) That um, (laughs) it's, you know, whatever its intended function, that is certainly not what it does now. Um, It's, it's a, it's a blocking means it, as we all realize by this point, I mean, it's a way of, of creating uh, a, a supermajority threshold for 
legislation to advance and it is used by the minority to gum up the works. And when you're in the minority, you tend to like this quite a bit. And when you're in the majority, you don't. And that wouldn't be true if either side could ever get to 60 votes or more. Uh, you know, the, the Democrats did briefly reach that threshold uh, early in the Obama administration. But other than that, it hasn't happened in a while. So we end up between, you know, within the 10 yard line on either side. Uh, and that means that the other side can always uh, exercise a kind of veto over what's going on and what legislation can advance. And that uh, that is the opposite of in, in incentivizing compromise. I, I, I can understand how in the abstract it would seem like it should, but in fact it doesn't. And, and I do think it might be likely to have the opposite effect that if you got rid of the filibuster, that could inspire compromise because then you would, you would have a different incentive structure for, uh, for trying to build larger coalitions. But we won't we wouldn't really know that until we saw it my own view on the filibuster is is pretty conflicted i mean i think uh, in general biden's instinct to kind of want to go back as bill said back to the future to a different form of the filibuster where it it, it exacts more costs to be impl- to be employed i think could be a good thing and a kind of halfway measure between where we are and just scrapping it entirely um it, there is something very short-sighted about democratic antsiness about wanting to crash through this barrier and just assuming that oh well we'll always have a majority so it won't matter i mean Already, there's a tough election coming up in less than two years, and then again another two years after that. And what if, what if it ends up 55, 45 Republicans? Then the then the Democrats will be pretty unhappy <laughs> with the situation, and they can obviously anticipate that. So exactly why they're being so short sighted about it is a little bit beyond me. Um, but I don't, I, I, I tend to be non-radical in everything. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it strikes me as, as a pretty bold move to just quash the, uh, the institution entirely. The, this, unlike, uh, some, some reform moves, uh, involves changing a rule that's been in force, uh, for a, a very long time. And I think it's perhaps, uh, um, unwise to just get rid of it altogether. Linda, um, Mitch McConnell uh, warned Harry Reid, who was then the majority leader uh, during the uh, Obama years, that uh, if he eliminated the filibuster for judicial appointments, he would live to regret it. And he said, sooner than you think. And sure enough, um, they, they did do it. And then, of course, McConnell and the Senate Republicans with Donald Trump were able to push through a huge number of judges, including three Supreme Court justices. Um, so uh, he he points out that, uh, or he argues rather, that is McConnell, he argues that if the Democrats do this, it's going to be a scorched earth Senate, as he puts it, uh, that, that will be... Um, he said, when we get back into the majority, how will you like this? He said, uh, defunding Planned Parenthood and sanctuary cities on day one, a whole new era of domestic energy production, sweeping new protections for conscience and the right to life of the unborn. And he goes on. Um, what do you make of that argument? Well, what I make of it is uh, I listen when Mitch McConnell makes threats, and I think he's exactly right. I think he would, in fact, carry through on that. Uh, I'm not in favor of getting rid of the filibuster altogether. We managed to do some pretty darn big things, and some of them very controversial, even with the filibuster in place. I've spent a lot of my uh, life uh, studying the uh, passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We managed to get the Civil Rights Act passed even with the filibuster. And I do like uh, Biden's proposal that we go back to the talking filibuster. I think there should be some cost um, in in, 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 uh, having a filibuster. I think 
people should have to stand up there, maybe in diapers if they're going to uh, speak for 24 hours uh, at, uh, at length. Um, and I also like Bill's idea of getting bills to the floor, allowing bills to come to the floor and maybe having a way to preserve uh, the ability to filibuster bills once they're on the floor. But the idea that the bill never actually makes it so that you can have a debate um, is something I'd like to see uh, some work around so that we can't uh, stop debate before it uh, even begins. But I'm, I'm not in favor uh, of getting rid of the filibuster. We've had it for a very long time. Uh, we've modified it, uh, changed it. Uh, and when we changed it on judges, I think uh, Democrats would agree. It certainly did not redound to their benefit. Sam, uh, The Onion list, uh, did a uh, list of pros and cons about abolishing the filibuster. Mo many of them are unrepeatable, but one of them <laughs> was for, uh, among the the, on the pro side, it was clears the way for fresh new obstructionist maneuvers. Uh, so, but um, but let me ask you to respond to this argument that that I have heard um, advanced, and that is that the filibuster is confusing to the voters. It's a it's a procedural maneuver that prevents the majority from enacting the policies it ran on, and yet the voters are not clear about where that, why the policy they voted for did not get enacted. And, and so the argument is you should let the voters elect the people that they want, let those people enact the policies that they ran on. And if they're unsuccessful, the voters will know who to punish or reward if they're, if they are successful. What do you think about that argument? I, I tend to agree with them. I'm not a big fan of the filibuster. And I think um, it's not just the filibuster in isolation. It's the filibuster as a as a parameter in a bigger system that has changed dramatically over over the decades um, to the point where where it's mostly just partisan gamesmanship rather than um, at, you know actual negotiation over over legislation and the U.S. has a ton of you know big problems that it needs to fix big structural problems things that can't be done through reconciliation um, and one of the byproducts of having the filibuster isn't that we you know um, grind legislation to a standstill, but instead that we package legislation in a way that will pass through reconciliation, but by, then by nature is incredibly, um, you know, incredibly suboptimal to, <laughs> to put it mildly, but also uh, totally you know, overwhelmingly fiscal in nature. And a lot of the, the big things we have to fix in this country are, are more, more regulatory, but I, I don't think you can just get rid of the filibuster on its own and expect, um, and expect a big change. If, like, I want to get back to a point where Committees are actually the center of the legislative process and are oh, able to crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is hopeless this... idealist. <laughs> I mean, we saw it as recently as the CARES Act. The CARES Act came together with exceptional speed relative to the normal regular order and and an awful lot of uh, bipartisanship. You know, whether it was you know Rubio's um, small business committee putting together the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and you had had uh, the finance committee putting together the UI provisions. That was only possible because those committees were uh, were ready, and um, and that shouldn't just be done in states of emergency. That that I would it'd be nice to get back to a more regular order where um, where just because something doesn't meet the Hassert rule that uh, it can't get floor time and can't get a vote. And I think in the longer run, in the short run, there will be costs, but in the longer run, um, it will shift democratic competition back. To, towards programmatic things like what is your program for xyz what, what are you going to do in healthcare um, and there might be some whiplash in the short run <laughs> but it's a hell of a lot better than the democratic co competition being over um, you know uh, procedural tactics or voter suppression mm. okay let us now turn to our final segment highlight low light of the week uh, let us begin with linda fascinating. It comes from the Atlantic. Uh, Linda, you were muted for the first part. Can you restart? I will start again. Uh, I'm going to recommend something that may not be to everyone's taste, but I found it fascinating. And it comes from the Atlantic this month. It is uh, called The Identity Hoaxers uh, by Helen Lewis. And it, it's a long piece that actually examines the phenomena of people who assume 
uh, identities, particularly the identities of minorities, uh, in order to draw attention to themselves. And the subtitle sort of says it all. What if people don't just invent medical symptoms to get attention? What if they feign oppression too? And it likens uh, the phenomena with people like Jessica Krug, the GWU professor who uh, pretended to be Black for a number of years, uh, to those um, who feign medical conditions, uh, the Munchausen phenomena or syndrome. And sometimes it's called Munchausen by proxy where a mother will invent all sorts of diseases that her child may have in order to get attention. And I found it fascinating. There were lots more of these identity hoaxers than I had been familiar with, uh, and I found it good reading. Interesting. Sam? Oh, uh, this is hi Highlights. Um, yeah. <laughs> give a plug for a new report we put out this week called So You Want to Do an Infrastructure Project? Um, by Alain Lavi. Uh, Alain is an expert in uh, urban transportation policy and uh, has done a lot of studies. He, he runs a um, comprehensive database of every single subway construction project in the world. Um, hmm. and, uh, and the big mystery is why um, does U.S. infrastructure cost 10 times what it does in other countries, countries just as rich as us, just as, you know, um, uh, you know, sometimes even stronger labor unions. So it's not that uh, we're really, what it comes down to uh, is a, a lack of state capacity. Um, so one of the uh, examples is, you know, in Rome, they have a full-time staff of 10 people who award contracts for construction projects and infrastructure based on a technical score. Um, and you need that staff to do those technical scores in the U S um, the, those transit agencies are basically staffless until there's a big stimulus package and then they rapidly staff up. And then they, uh, because there's deadlines on the stimulus, they have to get it out the door quickly. But then all of a sudden, um, you know, they give it to the lowest cost bidder and the construction project, of course, comes over budget and slips on its schedule. And then there's lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. And lo and behold, uh, you end up paying a uh, billion dollars for a kilometer of, of subway where in the, in the rest of the world, it's, it's only 250 million per kilometer of subway. Um, and so he, he uh, runs down a, a list of recommendations that I think are, are long overdue. Um, and I, I, hope, I hope that somebody from the Biden administration is listening because if they want to do a big infrastructure package, they're not going to get their bank for their buck until they clean up um, the way we actually do procurement and contracting. Uh, and this goes back to my previous point about, you know, a lot of our problems in this country are not just purely fiscal in nature. They require some regulatory reforms that are not going to be done through reconciliation. Thank you for that. I, I love hearing about those possibilities, uh, though I, I must confess that it does make me sort of blink and tilt my head to think that Italy has a more efficient system about this than we do. But, you know, maybe they do. Um, OK, uh, Damon. Well, uh, at the risk of sounding like I'm uh, kissing up to my boss and the people who play, pay the bills around here, uh, I'm going to choose uh, an essay of Mona's from this week in the Bulwark titled uh. <laughs> J.D. Vance Joins the Jackals, which was a very good column uh, about, well, exactly that. J.D. Vance, you know, the the author of uh, Hillbilly Elegy, uh, had tremendous success with that book and now a movie. Uh, has been kind of uh, hovering around the political world for the last few years. He's a Republican. He began as very critical of Donald Trump back when his book first came out in 2015, 16. Uh, and he has now fully joined with uh, the most Trumpist uh, factions of the party. This week it was announced Peter Thiel, uh, the venture capitalist and nationalist slash populist Trumpist uh, a uh, billionaire has uh, donated $10 million to a PAC so that Vance can run for uh, the Senate. And, uh, you know, I, first of all, Mona's piece is very good. Um, so I recommend it on this topic. But I will, I will also note that the reason why this piece edged out a couple of others that I was thinking of mentioning today is that Vance had such an obnoxious tweet this morning that I, I decided, yeah, he deserves the, the rap on the knuckles. <laughs> His tweet ran as follows. We have a border crisis because Democratic donors love cheap labor. That's it. That's the mm -hmm. entire thing. He, like, as if GOP donors don't like cheap labor. As if 
farmers who vote for the Republican Party don't <laughs> love cheap labor, as if any American who likes cheap goods and services doesn't benefit from having uh, an open immigration policy or at least a relatively liberal one. Uh, it was just a perfect example of kind of d deliberately dumbing down uh, political rhetoric for the sake of political gain. And uh, it proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Vance has, in fact, joined the Jackals. So good piece. Thank you so much. Uh, Bill Galston. Yeah, I think there'd be pretty broad agreement and broadening agreement uh, that the relationship between the United States and China is going to shape the world for good or ill uh, over the next decades more than any other relationship. In that connection, uh, I commend everyone's attention a poll uh, that Gallup made public just a couple of days ago headline, New High in Perceptions of China as U.S.'s Greatest Enemy. It found that in the past, in the past 18 months, the number of Americans, the share of Americans you know, calling China the U.S.'s greatest enemy had doubled from 22% to 45%. And at the same time, the number of Americas, Americans who believe that China's economic rise poses a, quote, critical threat to the United States has gone up by 23 points from 40 to 63 percent. Uh, what this tells me is that the public predicate for something that looks very much like a new Cold War is, is quickly taking shape. Well, mine actually dovetails with yours, Bill, because I want to talk about uh, the response to the recent spate of violence against Asian Americans. Um, that uh, culminated uh, this week with a terrible um, massacre of uh, eight um, Asians in, in the Atlanta area. Um, and uh, there has been an uptick over the last year in, uh, in, in attacks and hate crimes against Asian Americans. And a lot of people have speculated that it is because they are falsely being blamed for the uh, coronavirus. So that's obviously awful. But I want to point out that a lot of the coverage, a ton of the coverage, in fact, practically the entire uh, Washington Post today, as well as NPR and a lot of other outlets, have been presenting this as another example of white supremacy. Now, white supremacy is a serious problem in this country, and I don't diminish it one little bit, but the rush to say that this, um, first of all, this killing, the particular one that happened down uh, in Georgia, it's not really clear. The person seems kind of nuts, but not clear that it's a hate crime. But in any event, it's whatever. I mean, it, um, the, the fact is, though, that in all of the discussion about the um, increase in violence against Asians and the, the attributing of it to an uptick in white supremacy, nobody except Vox has acknowledged that many of the perpetrators of violence against Asians have been African-American people. So the idea that it fits neatly into the, into the box that the press wants to, some in the press want to put it into, that this is you know, more evidence of white supremacy. I mean, there may be some, of course, but there's also some inter, you know, black Asian conflict here. It's complicated, in other words. And uh, so I, I, I appreciate Vox uh, for, for noting that there are many ethnic tensions that are at play here. And uh, it, isn't, it isn't just a matter of, uh, of uh, white supremacists. With that, I want to thank Samuel Hammond for joining us. Great to have you. I want to thank all of you for listening. I kindly rate and review us. You can write to me. My email address can be found at The Bulwark. And um, next week, we'll be back as every week. Mm -hmm.